chapter 11 worksheet problems. We have two here. The first one has to do with measuring your body's density. So you and a friend both find that you sink in water. Congratulations. And you want to determine who is more dense. In this case, we're meaning density, not, not anything to do with intelligence. To determine this, you and your friend take a five-gallon plastic jug that is initially empty and jump into a swimming pool. Holding your jug completely submerged, you each allow water in until neutral buoyancy is reached. That is, when you first jump in with that thing, that jug, and it's full of air, you're both going to float. And then you let water slowly go into that jug until you float lower and lower and lower. And then neutral buoyancy is the point where if you are pushed down, you'll just keep going down. If you're pushed up, you'll just keep going up. So you are at equilibrium. So neutral buoyancy is an equilibrium situation. And because we learn from, well, I don't want to give away the first question. So I'll, I'll just move forward, forward from there. Now a hint, ignore the weight of the jug or the air in the jug. That is we're going to treat the jug as being water and vacuum. I know it's not vacuum, but the density of air is 1.225 kilograms per meter cubed whereas water is 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. So it's a factor of more than 800. And so it's, it's pretty negligible. So we have these numbers and we want to find each person's actual volume and the actual um, density they have. So what's the concept? And we're like, well, we've got density, we have floating. Floating is a hot tip. It's going to be Archimedes' principle. Pretty much anything that has to do with floating and buoyancy is Archimedes' principle. So draw a dry, dry diagram showing the forces act on a person holding the submerged jet. So here's my person. <laughs> here's the jug that is going to be partially filled with water. So if we look at the forces have a downward force due to gravity is equal to the mass of the person times g. And I have an upward force of buoyancy that's equal to the density of the fluid, in this case that's water, times the volume displaced times g. Well, what is the volume displaced? That's really the key to this problem. You have the volume displaced is the volume of you, which I'm looking for, plus the amount of water, or excuse me, the amount of air that was left in your jug. So I need to take this and say, okay, 3.50 gallons of water were added. That means that I had 1.50 gallons of air. Whereas my friend, 1.56 gallons, that means they had 3.50. 4, 4 gallons of air. And of course, gallons. Gallons? Who works in gallons? Not me. So we want to convert these gallons of air into liters. So 1.50 gallons of air times conversion factors 3.78541 liters per gallon. Technically, the abbreviation for liter is lowercase script L, but it's so confusing. People always see that wrong, so that's why I'm just putting a capital L. For your friend, that's going to be 3.44 gallons of air times 3.78541 liters per gallon. And so that gives you the numbers. The volume displaced by U is the volume of U plus, it turns out to be 5.678 liters. And for your friend, it's their volume plus 13.022 liters. So we found what the volume displaced is in terms of the volume of U, and likewise for your friend. Now the statement I was starting to get to and I didn't want to give it away earlier, that's the Archimedes principle. When neutrally buoyant, the weight of displaced water equals the weight of the object. That is, you're in equilibrium, the sum of forces is zero. 
So create an equation utilizing Archimedes principle using mass of the person, density of water, volume displaced, and G, and then solve for the volume displaced. So that's just going to be doing the old equilibrium problem. Call up direction the positive y direction. Sum of the forces in the y, it's an equilibrium of zero. That's going to be density of the fluid times volume displaced times G is equal to the mass of the person times G. Now, that's all good. Mass of the person, density of water, volume displaced G, and then solve that for volume displaced. Volume displaced. Notice there is a G on both sides. So I can cancel the G. And the volume displaced is the mass of the person over the density of the fluid. Fluid, in this case, being water. Now use the relationship between density, volume, and mass to solve for the actual volume and density of each person. So for the volume displaced for each person, I'm going to have to stop that. For person, well, for you, I have volume of you is equal to volume displaced minus 5.678 liters, right? That's from this equation right here. So that's equal to the mass of you over the density of water. Minus 5.678 liters. The mass of U was 87.4 kilograms. Density of water. Density of water is 1 kilogram per liter. 1 gram per milliliter is the same as 1 kilogram per liter. 87.45 by 1 is 87.4 liters. Um, Minus 5.678 gives me 81.72. Now, I said 81.72. How many sig figs do I have here? I only have 30. Um, well, yeah, it's going to be 3 when I'm done still. So 81.7 is the correct sig figs. To get the density, I'll want to go at least one further. If I do the same calculation for my friend, they are going to have um, 105.6 divided by one kilogram per liter minus 13.022. And that, by the way, these numbers here also have too many sig figs because there's really only three of them. But those were intermediate values, so I left them. So that gives me 92.6. Liters for the volume of my friend. And then for density, well, density is mass over volume. So for me, that's going to be 87.4 kilograms divided by 81.7 liters. So 87.4 divided by 81.7 is 1.07 kilograms per liter. And for my friend, we have 105.6 kilograms divided by 92.6 gives me 1.14 kilograms per liter. So my friend is more dense. What does that mean in a practical sense? It probably means that my friend has a bigger proportion of muscle. Now, I just made up these numbers. I don't remember what the density of muscle is. But muscle is more dense than water. Fat is less dense than water. And thus, people who float have a higher percentage of muscle compared to people, or excuse me, so they work backwards. People who float have a lower density, thus a higher percentage of fat. People who sink have a higher percentage of muscle compared to each other. Okay, that was a fun problem. Second problem, a balloon is filled with nitrogen gas, and the density of nitrogen gas is 1.25 kilograms per meter cubed at atmospheric pressure. How deep in water must the balloon be taken before it sinks on its own? Now you think about this and you might say, as I've seen other places, it doesn't matter what the depth is, if it floats, it floats, if it sinks, it sinks. 
But the issue here is that the gas is highly compressible. Remember the states of matter. A gas can be compressed fairly easily. It'll take on whatever shape it's within. Whereas a solid we say is incompressible. A liquid we say is incompressible. The truth is that liquids can be compressed. And in fact, at the depth we're going to get, the water would definitely be compressed. It would be more dense. It would actually then change the equation for the, dent, the pressure at that depth. But we're going to treat the water as perfectly non-compressible. We're also going to say the water temperature stays the same all the way down. So let's start off. What's the concept involved here? Well, the concept, because we're talking about floating and sinking, that throws us straight into Archimedes' principle. Draw a diagram showing the forces acting on the submerged balloon. <laughs> this is really a tough diagram. Here's the balloon. I have the force of gravity is equal to mass times gravity. And I have the force buoyant is equal to the density of water times the volume displaced times g. Okay, simple enough. Recall that helium is an ideal gas. Now, in this class, we will learn about ideal gases in the next chapter. So we haven't technically talked about it in this chapter or yet, but I put this in here just as good practice because I believe most of you already know things like Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law says that pressure times volume is constant if we keep the temperature and number of molecules constant. So PV equals P0 V0. So as the pressure increases, the volume decreases. So the volume displaced, the buoyant force drops as you go down because pressure is increasing. That's why you can reach a point where, oh, now it starts to sink. So use this equation, the equation for pressure change with depth. Pressure change with depth, that equation is our very common change in pressure is density times G times the change in height, or in this case, I will put times depth. So my volume displaced, volume displaced is the volume of the helium, or volume of helium nitrogen. And so that's going to be the pressure initial times the volume initial over the pressure, which is pressure initial plus delta P. And then putting in my delta P, that's pressure initial, volume initial, over pressure initial plus rho G D. So there I have pressure initial, volume initial, over Pressure initial plus rho water GD. There's my volume displaced as a function of depth. Now, the balloon will start to sink when its density equals that of water. Assuming incompressible water, use the equation from part C to find the density of nitrogen gas as a function of depth. So the density for the nitrogen gas is equal to mass of the nitrogen gas over the volume. Displace is what I'm going to put since that's what I did before. Now putting in that volume displaced, that's mass of the nitrogen gas over pressure initial, volume initial, divided by pressure initial plus rho of water GD. Well, when you divide fractions, you invert and multiply. So that's mass of nitrogen over pressure initial, volume initial, times pressure initial plus rho water GD. Ah, but there are things to observe. Simplifications. Mass of nitrogen over volume initial times Pressure initial over pressure initial plus density of water G D over pressure initial. There I've distributed the pressure initial. 
Why didn't I distribute the volume? Well, for an obvious reason. Mass over volume initial, that's the density of nitrogen initial. Pressure initial over pressure initial is 1. So the pressure is a function, of, or the density is a function of depth, is this equation. But at equilibrium, when it's neutrally buoyant, that's the density of water. So now all I have to do is take this equation, let me change that to a different color, and solve it for D. So... Solving it for that baby. So first thing I'll do is divide both sides by density of nitrogen initial. Now I'll subtract one from both sides. Uh, density of water over density of nitrogen initial minus 1 equals density of water G over pressure initial times D. It's important to be able to determine a P versus a row. My rows have a curvy back, as, as rows do. Final step then, divide by that material. So I have D is equal to pressure initial over the density of water, G, times density of water over density of nitrogen initial, minus 1. And now I put in numbers. My pressure initial, well, I started at 1 atmosphere, so 101325 pascals was my initial pressure. The density of water, 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed. Come on. G is 9.80 meters per second squared. And then density of water, 10 to the third kilograms per meter cubed over the density of nitrogen initial, which was which was 1. Point, well, what was it? 1.2 something. 1.25 kilograms per meter cube minus 1. And when I put those all together, I get 8,260 meters to 3 sig figs. 8.26 meters deep. You know where you have to be to get to that? You have to be somewhere near the bottom of the ocean in the deepest part. The Marianas Trench goes down to a little bit beyond 10,000 meters. So you could reach that in the ocean, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be very high pressure down there, and our assumptions are clearly going to fail. The fun part was being able to apply the principles and get a what, what's going to turn out to be a rough estimate of the correct answer. Mm -hmm.